Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is Nick from Part Time Pilot, your host of the Audio Ground School podcast. If you're coming back to join us again, you've been listening, welcome back. If you're just joining us for the first time, welcome in. You've come to the right place if you're looking for free and very helpful content on your ground school knowledge for private pilots. So it's our complete online ground school, all the lessons in audio format, plus a little bit extra. I I go in detail a little bit more when I'm talking about certain topics here on the podcast. So it's actually a little bit more where you can listen to wherever you want completely for free. So welcome in if you are the new here. And either way, whether you're new or not, please, please, please uh, subscribe to the podcast. You'll get notified of you know the next episodes dropping and it also automatically, at least on my phone, will automatically download for you so that if you're ever without internet and you want to you know, learn some ground school, you'll have a couple episodes downloaded. And it also helps us out, get seen and all that. And please, you know, also leave us a glowing review if you don't mind. All right, well, there's a couple things I want to talk about before we get into finishing up the section on human factors in the online ground school. So a few weeks ago, we took a break from the online ground school content on these podcast episodes. We just did something fun, right? I talked about my favorite aircraft, the SR-71 Blackboard. I shared some crazy facts about it and a crazy cool story about it. And I got a lot of good feedback from that episode. So in light of that, I've talked about a podcast in the past that I recommend. I have a new one because so many people like that episode. I do want to stick mostly to our ground school content here to be valuable for people looking for that ground school content. Every once in a while, I might do an episode like that. But there's a podcast that is completely dedicated to these great tales in aviation. So I'd like to take a moment to tell you about a fun new podcast called So There I Was. If you're a fan of aviation or simply enjoy hearing captivating stories, then this is the podcast for you guys. Hosted by former Marine pilots Fig and Repeat, this podcast shares firsthand accounts of flying experiences that will have you on the edge of your seat. Whether you're in the mood for something funny, scary, poignant, or tragic, this podcast has it all. With a relaxed and conversational tone, the pilots share their stories like you're sitting right there with them at the bar after a flight. Hear from fighter pilots, astronauts, Blue Angels, aircraft carrier captains, Navy and Coast Guard rescue pilots, and many more. Most have survived near-death experiences. Others have overcome incredible disabilities to continue to fly airplanes. You'll hear about heart-pumping moments in the cockpit, hilarious screw-ups during flights, insane hijinks off-duty, and the challenges pilots routinely face. Hear what it feels like to be shot off the bow of a carrier or into space. Experience the terror of landing on a pitching deck on a night so black that the pilot can barely taxi afterwards because... Their legs are shaking so badly. Hear firsthand how lonely it is in the middle of the ocean in a life raft on a dark night in eight-foot seas. Each story is unique and told with a level of detail that will make you feel like you were there. You'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll laugh until you cry, but one thing is certain, you will not be bored. So there I was, it's all how great aviation tales begin. Go check out that podcast. I've listened to a few of their episodes already and I got a few more downloaded for the next time I travel or I'm working out and again if you like that SR-71 podcast episode that we did the really cool awesome aviation stories and you'd like it can only get better if that story instead of read by me was read by the actual pilot that that story is about and on this podcast so there I was that's what it is they bring on the actual people and they tell their actual stories really 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 cool thing so go check that out should be on any podcast app. It's called So There I Was. All right, and the other thing I want to talk to you guys about is I mentioned this in the last episode, but the use of artificial intelligence or chat GPT type tools in flight training. So I have played around with ChatGPT a lot and it is a very, very powerful tool and it can be extremely helpful for learning new things. And because it, imagine it's like Google, but you can have a conversation. You know, Google is actually even changing in the future. Instead of having it give you a bunch of links that it thinks will answer your question, it's just going to have its AI answer the question for you. So it's going to cause so many changes in every training industry And what Part-Time Pilot has done is we are already embracing it. So we have taken ChatGPT and we have 
a subscription to the premier version of chat GPT that has no limits on it. So you can talk to it, chat with it as much as you want. I know that the free version, there's some limitation to that. So we have a subscription to that and we have integrated it into our courses. So on our online ground school and in our check ride prep course, at the end of every lesson, there's a link. It's to, to talk to your chat GPT instructor. Now, once you click that, it's going to be a little pop-up and there's going to be a tutorial video that I want you guys all to watch that tells you kind of some of the limitations of it. It doesn't know everything. It can be wrong and that you should always trust, you know, the ground school content, the FAA and your flight instructor, right? Those are the things that you should trust. But with that said, ChatGPT can be super, super powerful. I show an example about talking to it about density altitude, just having a conversation. It remembers what I asked before. So I can ask it to, you know, say it simpler or expand upon its previous answer. It's a really, really powerful tool. I even had a student use it to suggest a kind of a, a flight route for a cross country plan. Super crazy, awesome tool that now you can use inside part-time pilot lessons. And the really cool thing that we are working on now is we are building a unique version, our own unique version of ChatGPT. So it's going to be trained on everything part-time pilot. So all the knowledge that I have, questions you have about you know your account, your ground school, whatever, anything within the ground school is going to be trained upon it and it's going to be a part-time pilot AI entity that is going to be super duper awesome and super duper powerful. So it takes a while, it's a lot of work, but we are working to train that up and have it integrated into the site so that anytime you're in a lesson and you just want it to expand on something, you know, you can just say, hey, you know, in on this topic, what is, you know, whatever your question is, can you expand upon this? Or can you re-explain this as if I was five years old or something like that? So a really, really powerful tool that we are going to be implementing in the near future. And I just wanted to announce that on the podcast because I kind of geek out about this stuff. I think it's really cool. It's a really powerful tool. And I think that everyone out there who is listening, if you have not experienced a little bit of AI, I highly recommend that you do because like the internet, it is really going to change everything. So hopefully all for the better. I've definitely had those nights where I see all the doom and gloom possibilities of AI, but if we can regulate it safely, but also allow you know the, the private sector to make it great, then I think it could be super, super powerful. So Part-time pilot is going to be always at the forefront of technology. So that's what we're doing. We're going to embrace it fully. So, all right, that is enough of the announcements. Let's get to the lessons. In the last episode, we talked about spatial disorientation and illusions. And then we talked about carbon monoxide poisoning. This is all inside section 10 of the online ground school course. So the course is the private pilot lesson. So if you're inside the online ground school, which I highly recommend, go to my courses, click on step one, private pilot online ground school lessons, and then go to section 10 human factors. We are going to be doing today lesson eight on scuba diving if we have time we'll go to lesson nine aeronautical decision making and hazardous attitudes and then maybe lesson 10 on self-assessment so without further ado let's get to lesson eight on scuba diving the activity of scuba diving can cause decompression sickness that lingers in the body for several hours when diving to depths below the surface of the ocean the human body experiences an increased pressure this increased pressure causes the body to absorb more nitrogen Then, if the pressure is reduced rapidly, the diver comes up quickly with decompression, the nitrogen can turn gaseous and create bubbles in the tissues and blood. Symptoms of decompression sickness include difficulty breathing, skin rash, itchy skin, muscle pain, dizziness, loss of vision, and even unconsciousness. Kind of similar symptoms of like CO poisoning or hypoxia. Because of this, the FAA hasn't created a specific rule, but still mentions scuba diving as a danger and provides safety recommendations in the aeronautical information manual. The FAA saw that a lot of pilots also, for some reason, like to also scuba dive. I think it's kind of the the adventure, you know, inherited in a pilot that makes those two hobbies occur together. But the FAA realized that and they said, hey, we can't have people flying after they've gone scuba diving like this. So we need to come up with some ground rules 
rules and stuff. So that's what we're going to talk about here. And you might get asked about on the FAA written. So specifically the AIM states, a pilot or passenger who intends to fly after scuba diving should allow the body sufficient time to rid itself of excess nitrogen absorbed during diving. If not, decompression sickness due to evolved gas can occur during exposure to low altitude and create a serious in-flight emergency. The FAA recommends that a pilot wait at least 12 hours prior to flying up to altitudes of 8,000 feet MSL. If a dive has not required controlled ascent. That means no decompression stops. So again, so it's 12 hours. You have to wait 12 hours prior to flying for altitudes up to 8,000 feet if there was no decompression stops. And at least 24 hours prior to flying up to altitudes of 8,000 feet if a dive required controlled ascent or aka decompression stops. So you have to wait 24 hours prior to flying to up to 8,000 feet if there was a controlled ascent and up to 12 hours if there was no, did not require a controlled ascent. If the flight is above 8,000 feet MSL, then 24 hours must elapse regardless if the dive involved decompression or not. So to summarize, if flight above 8,000 feet, you have to wait 24 hours after a dive. If below 8,000 feet, you have to wait 12 hours if no decompression and 24 hours if decompression. So those two things are what you want to remember for the FAA written and if you are a scuba diver who also likes to fly. All right, so that is it. That's a short lesson on scuba diving. Let's move on to the aeronautical decision-making process and hazardous attitudes. A common thread among many general aviation accidents is the inability for pilots to make quick and sound decisions. Aeronautical decision-making process, the ADM, provides a systematic approach to the mental processes used by pilots to consistently determine the best course of action in response to a given set of circumstances. So when something goes wrong and you have to make a decision, the ADM basically makes that into a checklist or a process so that you have consistency and you're able to immediately, instead of freaking out for a long time, your brain says, oh, I'm trained on this ADM. What is it? Boom, boom, boom. Okay, so you are immediately put into action if you remember it. So it's a very, very helpful tool. Sounds pretty mundane and and pretty silly, but it is super helpful. ADM is a continuous process that must be performed throughout pre-flight, throughout taxi, throughout takeoff, cruise, descent, landing, taxi back, and tie down. The entire flight, it's a continuous process where anything, anytime something changes, the ADM process should be repeated. So it's a continuous process. You're always reevaluating the aeronautical decision-making process. To help pilots better apply the principles of ADM, the FAA adopted the 3P model. The 3P model offers a simple, systematic approach to accomplishing each ADM task during each phase of flight. The 3P model is perceive, process, and perform. Perceive the given set of circumstances and recognize hazards for your flight. So the way we do this is by PAVE, P-A-V-E, or I'm safe, or hazardous attitudes, those type of checklists, which we're going to get to. But these are sort of checklists that allow you to perceive the given set of circumstances and recognize hazards for your flight. Next P is process. Process by evaluating their impact on flight safety. Then lastly is perform. Perform by implementing the best course of action. So that would be like an emergency checklist once you've made a decision to, you know, Are you going to troubleshoot the radio? You're going to run that checklist or are you going to, you know, do a diversion and run that checklist, that type of thing. You're going to perform the actions that you've made a decision on after processing that information and after perceiving the hazard. Okay. During each phase of flight, the 3P model should be ran through in your head. Perceive the given set of circumstances for your phase of flight. That means gathering all relevant information or changes since the last phase of flight pertaining to your flight. This allows you to perceive the mission and the environment in which you will be flying. Process the information you gather, evaluate its impact on flight safety, and determine your best course of action. Finally, perform by implementing the best course of action. Performance results become information to be perceived and analyzed. Based on those results, pilots will decide whether to continue with the action or make a change. Okay, so that is, you know, the ADM in a nutshell. We got the 3P model, perceive, process, perform, 
And now we want to talk about a little bit more kind of the all encompassing ADM with some assessment tools and some information on some things that can cause you risk in flight. And the first thing we want to talk about is hazardous attitudes. Now, I really want you guys to make sure you hear this and you understand each and every one of these and you never <laughs> apply and you'll get to this when we talk about it, but this is a little bit meta. You don't want to apply one of the hazardous attitudes like the macho attitude or the invulnerability, like thinking, well, this isn't going to, none of these are going to happen to me. I don't have hazardous attitudes because we all have hazardous attitudes. So I want you to right now to just admit we're all going to admit that we have hazardous attitudes. Not one of us is perfect, okay? Now, once we admit that we have hazardous attitudes, we can be on the lookout for when they come. We won't be denying that they don't exist for us because that is the first step in getting you into trouble with hazardous attitudes. If that doesn't make sense, let me explain what they are. So hazardous attitudes will occur for every pilot, again, every pilot, every one of us, to some degree at some point in time. I don't mean to say that there is no escaping it, But thoughts come into our minds all the time, and it is up to us to determine how that thought will affect us. When a hazardous attitude or a hazardous thought comes into our minds, we do not want to let it linger and fester into a full-blown hazardous attitude. Therefore, we must take steps to neutralize and reverse this attitude. To do this, we use the ADM. The first step of the ADM process is to recognize or perceive the hazardous attitude or thought when it comes to us. So, To be able to perceive those, we have to know what they are. These are attitudes such as anti-authority, impulsivity, macho, resignation, and invulnerability. And you might be asked about any one of these on your FA written or your check right. So let's go through a little bit on each of them and what they are. So the first one is anti-authority. An anti-authority attitude can cause recklessness if a pilot starts to think that rules regulations and certain procedures don't apply to them. I for one have seen this live in action when this person was flying, I was flying nearby, it was kind of uncontrolled airspace where you're supposed to let other pilots know what you're doing and they were doing all sorts of crazy maneuvers, not telling anyone what they were doing nearby an airport and that, you know, there's a rule that says to state your intentions and to communicate with other pilots for a reason because if not, it puts them at risk because we can't read your mind through the air into your airplane so that pilot could have had you know they didn't think the rules or regulations didn't apply to them that's kind of anti-authority often pilots with the attitude of anti-authority will skip something in a checklist or regulation that leads to them getting into trouble with the law and into trouble with their own safety anti-authority is sometimes coupled with a macho attitude in that a pilot thinks they are above being told what to do The anecdote for an anti-authority attitude is to follow the rules. They are there for a reason. This is pretty simple. It's like, it's great to be confident. (laughs) It's great. It's a great thing to be confident, but don't be too confident that you start being stupid, right? So these rules are meant to keep us safe. They really are. It's not, you know, you can say all you want about the government, but it's not big government trying to, to limit our freedoms when it comes to flying. Like we have the opportunity to fly and the FAA is trying to make sure that we don't die. Like it's as simple as that. So let's follow those rules. They're there for a reason. That's the anecdote for anti-authority. Follow the rules. They're there for a reason. So if you think, so you're feeling anti-authority, you think about skipping a rule or procedure or a checklist item, think, no, these are there for a reason. Okay. So I'm not going to skip checking the tire pressure because it's on the checklist for a friggin' reason. All right. Sorry. I'm, I'm ranting a little bit here. The next one is impulsivity. When something happens, which requires action from a pilot, whether unexpected or not, a pilot with an impulsive attitude will think that they need to do something, anything, and they need to do it immediately. This attitude often leads to major mistakes and can put your life in danger. Almost every situation a pilot encounters can be thought about for a few seconds in order to make the correct action is taken. So when I think of impulsivity, I think of like being like, you know, the savior or a hero in a movie. And I I think of my favorite movie, Interstellar. So Interstellar, if you've never seen it, it's Matthew McConaughey's in it and they basically the world is in like starvation and drought and they have to like get people off earth into like a man-made orbiting world 
And so they're trying to figure out how to get this big spaceship off and all the stuff. And they, they end up time traveling. Anyways, I'm going, I'm getting out topic, but there's a scene. It's my favorite scene in any movie where they're really far away. They went through a, a black hole and they're in this new system. And Matt Damon's character is just woken up from a long slumber on some planet by himself. And he's going a little crazy. So he goes back to the Endurance, which is their main spaceship that can get them home. So he takes his, his little, you know, you know, orbiter or a little like lander plane. And he goes up there and he's trying to dock with it. Uh, but it, he's not following the procedures, right? And so this kind of goes to anti-authority. He doesn't think he needs to. He understands how the airlock works. He doesn't, He so he starts overriding the stuff. And then it causes a depressurization and like half of the whole endurance, which is this like round circular kind of spinning spacecraft, it blows up and it causes the endurance to start to spin. And meanwhile, Matthew McConaughey and the other people, they're in their little lander and they're just watching this happen. And all of a sudden, and they have limited fuel, right? And so all of a sudden, I'm going on a huge tangent, but <laughs> this is my favorite movie, so I don't care. So all of a sudden, Matthew McConaughey just starts like flying towards it. And one of the robot guys is like, what are you doing? Like, it's no point wasting fuel. And then the, Anne Hathaway is like, like, what are you doing? And he's like, you know, I'm docking. And this thing's like spinning crazy. And she's like, you can't dock. That's impossible. And he just goes, No. It's necessary. And it's like one of the coolest things. If you haven't seen it, go look it up on YouTube. It's like the docking scene in Interstellar. And the music is just great. Hans Zimmer. Anyways, love that movie. I'm totally geeking out. But that was impulsivity. In that situation, right, we see it in Hollywood all the time. You know, he made a quick decision to then go and dock so that they had a chance to get home. Because if he couldn't dock with that spaceship before it crashed into the planet and save that spinning spaceship, they would never be able to get home. So he made a quick decision they had to make right away. And we see that all the time in like Hollywood and hero movies. And so we want to be like that, right? So we want to make these really quick decisions. But if you make them without thinking everything through, you know, maybe Matthew McConaughey's character had thought everything through and he knew that that was their only chance. And so he was able to do that quickly. And the more experience you have, the more, the quicker you can make those decisions. I'm not saying that's not impossible to live up to, You know, that's what great pilots and astronauts and those things live up to and train their whole lives for. I'm not saying that that's not it, but when you do it without thinking, that's an impulsive attitude. So anyways, that was my sidebar. I love that movie. If anybody wants to talk about that movie, just send me an email and I'd love to geek out on it. But all right, so what's the anecdotal phrase? Each one of these has an anecdotal phrase, a cure that you can think, a thought that you can think or you can say out loud when you're feeling these things or you recognize these things that can reverse the thought the hazardous attitude so the one for impulsivity is not so fast think first right so usually you have at least 30 seconds to a minute to think things through before making a decision that might actually make things way worse all right the next one is macho a macho attitude is an attitude where a pilot is always trying to impress by taking unnecessary risks A macho attitude usually leads to an attitude of invulnerability and anti-authority as well. Pilots should always be confident in their abilities, but not be too confident that they begin to take risks and skip safety steps put in place to protect them. The anecdote for macho attitude is always believe that taking chances when flying is foolish. Now, this kind of makes me think of, did you guys see that YouTuber who jumped out of his plane and crashed it for views <laughs> that kind of remind i don't know if that's exactly a macho attitude it's some maybe we need to come up with a new hazardous attitude for youtube and tiktokers i don't know but that's kind of what i think of when i think of a macho attitude so again always believe that taking chances when flying is foolish and don't be a macho overconfident person you know let flying and the air and gravity humble you at all times and, and so that we can be safe The next one is resignation. An attitude of resignation is the opposite of macho and is when a pilot has too little confidence. So again, we got to have that right amount of confidence. Confidence is good, but you don't want to be way overconfident. You also don't want to be too little confident. When feeling resigned, a pilot focuses on all the negatives and stops caring about everything, including checklist steps and important aspects of safety. This attitude is very dangerous in times of emergency because the pilot will feel hopeless and not act with the decisiveness needed in such a situation. Now, 
I felt resignation at some points during my pilot training. I will admit it. There were times after my like fourth instructor where I got this instructor that loved to yell at me every time something went bad. And that would just sort of make me freeze up and sort of resign. And he would just continue. He thought yelling would make that even better. And then when I would kind of freeze up and sort of resign for even just a moment, I would make even more mistakes. And then he would just take over the aircraft. He just thought I was the worst pilot and the stupidest human being on earth. When really I was just resigning because I did not take to his teaching style of just screaming at me. I don't think many people do. And in reality, I think I'm a pretty decent pilot. Looking back, you know, the resignation thing that I admit, I was resigning in that moment. And the anecdote for resignation is to never believe that your situation is hopeless. There is always something you can do to improve your situation and help your odds. So I guess in that situation, instead of resigning and just feeling like there was nothing that I could do to have my flight instructor happy, I could have, you know, thought more positively and thought, you know, it doesn't matter if he's yelling at me. I'm going to focus on on becoming a better pilot. I'm not going to resign. I'm going to continue to try to do my checklist. If I make mistakes, he yells, so be it. He's not going to affect how I fly this airplane. So never believe that your situation is hopeless. Now, the last one I want to talk about is invulnerability. An invulnerable attitude is when a pilot thinks they are Superman, Superwoman, they're invincible, and that it just won't happen to them because they are different. And this might be the, the YouTuber that jumped out of the airplane. I know I have been also been a victim of this attitude before, seeing plane crashes on the news and simply thinking, ah, oh, must have been a, a bad pilot. That's not me, right? We can't think this. We got to think, instead of hearing about a plane crash on the news, you know, let's wait for the NTSB report and see what went wrong, see what we can learn from that, instead of simply just thinking they were probably just a bad pilot. That's not me. I'm invulnerable to that stuff. When in reality, I should have been, again, Right. So when I thought that I should have been learning from that pilot's mistakes, because God knows I make plenty of mistakes, too. We all do. So we, we don't want to have this invulnerable attitude. The anecdote for this is it could happen to me. OK, so when we see that on the news, we see something else. It could happen to me. Right. You see an engine fail. It could happen to me. You see all the electronics fail. It could happen to me. Not like probably two weeks ago, I posted something on TikTok and Instagram that was these funny videos where they take like a cutout of a funny scene in a movie or something. And and it was a clip from a TV show. I can't remember the TV show, but it was on Comedy Central. It was called like Workers or something like that. And it's a scene where it's one guy and then two guys consoling him. And he's like, he was so scary. I almost died. <laughs> and so I posted that when pilots who never learned how to navigate or use piloted dead reckoning without a GPS and their GPS fails. So that's kind of like, don't just fully rely on your GPS, right? If you think that would never happen, my GPS is always going to be there. If you're out on a cross country somewhere and you lose your GPS, boom, it could happen to you. You need to know how to navigate without that. You don't want to get lost in that situation. A lot of people say, oh, well, you could just call flight following. Yeah, you could, but sometimes, what if that's not working? What if your radio also goes down? What if you lose electrical components, certain components? So we always have to think it could happen to me or not. And you could put yourself up into the risk of these things actually happening to you and you not being prepared. But that's not how I live my life. Already inherently do something very dangerous as flying small aircraft in general aviation. I myself like to do everything in my power to make it that much more safe. All right, so those are my rants, but there is a mnemonic device that I came up with to remember the hazardous attitudes, and that is my air, but it's spelt like M-I-A-I-R. So my air, and it's macho, impulsivity, anti-authority, invulnerability, and resignation. And there's a little graphic in here that shows the my air and has a just a quick little note next to each one of them to tell you what it is really helpful uh, learning aid and memorization aid there so all right all right now we're going on about 20 25 minutes now but i really want to finish up lesson 10 on self-assessment this is the last lesson on section 10 human factors so let's get it finished up so that we can check off section 10 and we can get to the next section which is on weight and balance and then after that cross-country planning so we got so a lot of material to cover. Those are some big 
big chunks of the online ground school. So that'll be exciting. So let's get to the last lesson. So this is on self-assessment. Self-assessment checklists and handy mnemonics have been developed to help pilots perceive risks. Again, that's part of the 3P, 3P model, right? Perceive, process, perform. So perceive risks prior to and throughout a flight. These assessments help with the first step of the ADM process, the perceive step. Okay, so the first checklist I wanna talk about is the I'm safe checklist. So I-M-S-A-F-E, that stands for illness, medications, stress, alcohol, fatigue, and eating, or food and water, right? So I'm safe, that's the mnemonic device. We got a little picture of it, which is a good memorization tool inside the online ground school. Let's talk about a little bit of each one of these. So first one is illness. Are you ill or experiencing any effects that may have an impact on your ability to fly. You wanna ask yourself this, you wanna go through this checklist, again, at the beginning of flight and then throughout your flight to make sure you're doing these checklists, just like any other checklist, you're checking on yourself. So this is the I'm safe, so illness. You, are you feeling any effects that might impact your ability to fly? Medication, that's the next one, the M. Are you on any medications and are you cleared to fly with them by the FAA or suggested medications list from AOPA or your medical examiner. So we want to make sure that we're good there. You you know, God forbid we take one that we don't realize enhances the effects of hypoxia or something like that. So we really want to make sure we're good with our medications. Next one is stress. That's the S. Often overlooked, but stress can cause both physical and mental effects that can easily impact your ability to fly. And I put trust me here because, again, we talked about as a student pilot when I was flying with my flight instructor that I call like the stress tester that was just screaming at me the whole time. I would get stressed out. I would resign. That My training went backwards at that point. And I'm not blaming him. I'm blaming myself. I should have addressed it much earlier and seen these these effects. I should have put what I learned in my ground school to use. All right, the next one is alcohol. That's the A. Can we remember those rules? Eight hours bottle to throttle and no effects. Also below 0.04 uh, blood alcohol content. So did we drink in the last eight hours? Do we have any effects? Do we have any in our blood? We don't want to be flying after drinking. The next one is fatigue. That's the F. Are you tired? Did you get enough sleep? The effects of not getting a good night's sleep are incredible. I tell all my students, even just with the brain and not even physical, you know, being having physical energy, just the brain itself does not work. I listened to a long time ago, a friend sent me this uh, podcast, uh, this guy was like a sleep expert and just the type of statistic he had on the impacts of sleep. They did a bunch of studies on like athletes and like they correlated with sleep. And when athletes didn't get enough sleep, they would get injured more they would perform better and then they did like mental things too like they they were able to make decisions faster crazy 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 effects of sleep so you got to get your sleep it's, it's so important so the the f and i'm safe is fatigue ask yourself are you tired did you get enough sleep did you have a good night night sleep all that stuff last one is eating so that's kind of like food and water but we call it eating cuz it so it makes our i'm safe mnemonic do you have the energy to make the flight a good meal will give you the calories on long flights and may help you overcome things such as motion sickness and spatial orientation. Now you don't want to eat a bunch of junk food or have alcohol or a bunch of sugar or anything like that, but a good meal with some protein, some healthy food, and then even bringing like a protein bar with you on long flights. If you start to feel a little fatigued, you can, you know, pop in a couple bites of the protein bar and it should help you. So eating is important as well. All right, so that is the I'm safe checklist. This Again, this is a checklist you wanna run before your every flight and then when you get opportunities throughout your flight. If it's a long flight, when you get into cruise, run through it again and then before each flight, before you land, do it again. So, all right, that's the I'm safe checklist. All right, the next checklist and mnemonic device is a personal minimum checklist that we call the PAVE checklist. So P-A-V-E. It's a personal minimum checklist that gives a gives pilots a tool to evaluate risks that may crop up in multiple areas of flight. So what does it stand for? Well, the P stands for pilot, the A stands for aircraft, the V stands for environment. What? Yeah, you know, we do some funny things to to make the mnemonic works. But funnily enough, I don't know if funnily is a word, but oddly enough, we are still able to remember it. I know I was able to remember it. So environment, V is a unique, kind of a unique, not 
used a lot letter, so I guess that's how you remember it, but the V in environment is gonna be used for the PAVE. And then the last one is external pressure. So pilot, aircraft, environment, and external pressure. So let's talk a little bit about each of those in the PAVE personal minimums checklist. So pilot, that's your I am safe checklist. So we wanna basically, we're trying to perceive and check our personal minimums in each one of these phases of PAVE. So for pilot, we're gonna run through the I am safe checklist to try and perceive any issues with the pilot, me, us. All right, next one is aircraft. You know, is the aircraft airworthy? Did it pass the ground checks? Undergo any repairs or inspections recently? Are there any squawks, any limitations to the aircraft? Enough fuel? Do you have all the equipment needed? Did you run through all your pre-flight checklists with no issues? So those are all the things that like the FAA, you know, the certificates, the airworthiness certificates, the, the squawks, the checklists, all those things are meant to help you assess risk for the aircraft. The next one is environment. What is the weather like? Is there a lot of traffic? Are you comfortable with the forecast? Are there any TFRs, temporary flight restrictions? Do you have good alternates? Did you check pyrups and notums? Does the cabin environment cause you any possible issues such as too cold or too hot? So this is your outside environment, right? So there's a lot of information here. Some of that is included when you get a, a briefing for your flight plan. You call up 1-800-WX-BRIEF you know, brief. And they're going to give you, they're going to tell you the notums, they're going to tell you the weather in route, stuff like that. But that's not everything, right? You know, you want to check on these things yourself. You have, we have really powerful tools like Garmin Flight and ForeFlight and stuff like that, where we can look to see along our route of flight if there's any environmental things that can cause an issues, but also our immediate environment inside the cabin, right? Is there something in the plane that maybe might cause us an issue? Or is it gonna be a really hot day that maybe will make our iPad fry up, right? So these are also included in the environment, things we wanna assess. And the last one is external pressures. Are you stressed or anxious from some sort of external pressure? Maybe, you know, someone's going through a divorce, you had a family member pass away, you have a lot of stress at work or something. Will the flight stress you out? Is there something about the flight that stresses you out? Is there pressure to reach your destination quickly? I remember on my check ride during my oral exam in the cross country scenario, my examiner said, okay, imagine the scenario where you are taking a friend to a wedding, right? For this flight and the wedding is, is at your destination and you guys need to be there at noon and you're leaving at 8 p.m. and something happens. It's not maybe a super emergency, but do you go? Well, you never want to make a decision based off these external pressures, right? If there's an external pressure because you got to get to somewhere quickly or else you might be late, it's not worth it, all right? So we got to really assess these external pressures and whether they're affecting our decisions. If we didn't have this external pressure or this external thing, would we still make that decision? We have to ask ourselves that. So uh, another thing is, do you have a plan B or are you dealing with any difficult passengers or unhealthy situation. All right, so that's the PAVE checklist. It's a set of personal minimums and questions that you want to ask yourself about yourself, the pilot, about the aircraft, about the environment you're flying in, and about any other things or external pressures that may be affecting your decision making on your flight. All right, so that includes the I'm Safe checklist, and all those put together are tools on how to do the first step of the ADM, which is perceive. Perceive your risk in all those areas. All right, so hopefully those tools, you guys really take those to heart and use those in every single flight because they, it might just save your life and I don't want any of my students to be involved in something unfortunate. So let's not have those hazardous attitudes. Let's be super safe pilots and know that all these safety things are meant for a reason. They're for our safety and they're there to help us out. All right, that is it. That is it for lesson 10 on self-assessments and that's it for section 10 on human factors. So... When I talk to you guys next week, we're going to be starting section 11 on weight and balance. So that has, we have, we break that down into three lessons. I'm not sure how many we're going to do on the podcast because one of those lessons is just weight and balance examples. It's just a bunch of examples for online ground school. It might be a little hard. We'll definitely do a couple of them, talk through a couple of them here on the podcast, but I'm not going to do all of them because it's kind of hard to do these type of calculation things over audio, right? So we do have videos though that we'll post in those show notes for the weight and balance stuff. So 
But we'll get to that next week. Don't worry about that. The other lessons are on the theory, the weight and balance theory, questions you'll get on the theory of weight and balance, and then the procedure for weight and balance. And then we get into a bunch of examples. So, all righty. Thank you guys for listening, and I will catch you next week.